I've been doing a lot of talks on the nature of truth in science and the, uh, the concept of absolute truth being a real problem for scientists and often, quite often, for Christians as well. From a background, I call myself an, 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 an atomic anarchist at large because I spent most of my academic life putting atoms where they didn't want to be. So if you think tonight's talk is slightly anarchic, it's true to form. Uh, and uh, and uh, we'll go from there. So we've got quite a lot to get through. Um, and I thought we'd start off this quote from Albert Einstein, because I think this is a lot of the crux, we miss it. Imagination is more important than knowledge. For knowledge is limited to all we know now and understand, while imagination embraces everything, far more than we ever will know or understand. So when we start to look at truth, are we going to look at truth in the particular, the little bit that we understand, or much wider than that? I came across this uh, headline in the Times about three weeks ago. Uh, we're in trouble if we can't trust scientists. So, but I, I, last night I went to an opera in a little pub near where my flat is in London, and it was Donizetti's Elixir of Love, if anybody knows it. It's about this phony doctor who's got all these patients that are meant to bring a, you know, your loved one to join you. Of course, it turns out to be nothing at all. In fact, one place it was beer. But on the back, he said, of course it's true, science says so. He, and he held up a sign. And I always wonder who this person is who's called science, who says all these things. Who is he or she or it? Because right behind you have to find out that there's a person somewhere in there. But when you listen on the radio, they say, what does science say? And I think, well, it doesn't say anything, actually. But this is one I rather liked. Science says drinking coffee helps people slow aging, lose weight, and cheat death. So I've had my half cup of coffee. I should be okay for the night. Uh, and if you're not drinking it, now's the time to start. But you find out that this guy, Bill Murphy, was the guy who, who put this forward. Is it true? I don't know. Every day on the trade program, I'm always hearing what scientists have done. And they're always, it's always a half-baked story, as far as I can tell. And they're always wanting more money. This is the other one, ice cream before breakfast. What a load of nonsense. Of course, if you take more sugar before breakfast, of course you're going to be more alert. <laughs> but here we are, science says, or the study says, that eating ice cream for breakfast may improve mental performance. I'm sure it does. I've never tried it. But you might like to do a, a field test here. Give ice cream to everybody, see if it, it wakes them up. Um, anyway, if you eat ice cream, you have faster reaction times and less mental irritation, whatever that may mean. Uh, that, but science says... Uh, what is the truth? You know, there are lots of instances where falsity has come out. I was reading the number of retracted articles in science recently. It's a huge, especially in the biological and medical sciences, not so much in my own. But one thing I really found frightening, I was once recently asked for my publication, this one, I haven't looked at it for years, so I thought I'd check on the web of science. I found three publications with my name on, which I had no knowledge of. Okay, I'd just been put on to get a paper with Chinese authors into the system. I knew nothing about it. As it turned out, there was nothing too dramatic in them, but that's going on all the time. I used to be a director of a science publishing house, and they reckon that 40% of um, papers from China were, were plagiarized at one time. So do not get the feeling that all this peer review and all that nonsense is actually going to get rid of it. It's getting better. We have software packages to sort it out. But this was the big one, wasn't it? The MMR vaccine. And again, because of the huge amount of media coverage, and this is the media hyping it up, and I'll come back to that again in a little while, they can draw up and you start to say, hmm. But the fact that microwave phones, um, phones which put out microwaves into young children, uh, could possibly damage health is, of course, quietly forgotten. Okay, so who do we trust? Now, this is two years old now. Do we have any um, professional footballers here? Apparently, they're pretty untrustworthy. Uh, if we, do we have any nurses here? They're the most trustworthy, f followed by doctors. Now, this is really interesting that professors like myself are up there at 80, uh, what's it, 85%? And scientists are slightly less. Now, I'm a scientific pr a professor of science, so when do we come in? The average, are we at 83.5? I don't know. Are we trustworthy? But this is what the public, this is an Ipsos uh, Mori poll, this is what the public trusts. We're in a very interesting position if 85% of the population trust us when I actually don't necessarily trust my fellow people. So, the, oh, I should say the bankers are near the bottom, would you believe? Vickers come up, if I went back, Vickers about halfway up. And, of course, scientists uh, are near the top. I was going to put in one or two other characters, but I had a feeling you might uh, object. 
But for Christian, the truth is personal and revelational. It's nothing to do with what goes in our papers, necessarily. And if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. You will know about the relationship between God and man. But on what basis is science truthful? By comparison. And I ask myself, have we actually bartered the truth? Because we have so many stakeholders and pressures from outside. If you're an, if you're an academic like I was, um, you know, we're really looking for the next grant. So we've got to have something that sounds good. Um, almost all promotions in, in um, top universities are based on research output. Now, okay. <laughs> If you're in, um, in take up, uh, startups or in, in companies, it may well be investment uh, investors that you're trying to convince or trying to sell things. Also, too, we only see a very small part of scientific truth, and I'll come back to that again later. And I think we are called upon to look at the much bigger picture. So uh, the whole area of abiding was a book a few years ago, 2013, which Ben Quash uh, wrote about how to abide in the truth. It's an interesting book to read. It's a theological book rather than a scientific one. It's an old problem. Nothing really has changed. This is a quote from Plato. Strange times are these in which we live when old and young are taught falsehoods in school, and the person who dares to tell the truth is at once called a lunatic and a fool. So nothing very much has changed in this respect. <laughs> a good egg, Plato, in some respect, because he knew what was coming up. Now, here's a few quotes for you. Uh, one of my great heroes is Michael Faraday, who was told by his boss, uh, Humphrey Davy, to give up science because he couldn't afford it, go back to bookbinding, but he managed to stick around for long enough. Nothing is too wonderful to be true if it is consistent with the laws of nature. So truth is linked with consistency. It is the great beauty of our science, the advancement in it, whether in a degree great or small, instead of exhausting the subjects of research, opens the door to new possibilities, abundant knowledge, overflowing with beauty and utility. I don't think you'll see that in any grant application these days. And this last thing is about poetry. I'll come back to poetry right at the end. I am no poet, but if you think for yourselves as I proceed, the facts will form a poem in your mind. Is that how you see science? A poem in your mind. I'm going to come back to that. I had to put this last one in because you all know uh, the quote when he talked to Gladstone. And he said, what use is it? Gladstone said, what use is it? Well, sir, there's every probability you'll soon be able to tax it. Um, and of course, that's what we hope with genetic engineering, that you'll soon be able to tax it uh, and go on from there. Um, another favorite of mine is Ernest Rutherford. Uh, all science is either physics or stamp collecting. And I'm afraid it still is. A lot of science now is collecting data and not necessarily thinking about what those data mean or what the underlying causes are. So sometimes truth can be, did I collect the data properly? Now this is the next one about the history of physics. This is great, this one. Aristotle said a bunch of stuff that was wrong. Galileo and Newton fixed things up. Then Einstein broke everything again. Now we've basically got it all worked out, except for small stuff, big stuff, hot stuff, cold stuff, fast stuff, heavy stuff, dark stuff, turbulence, and the concept of time. <laughs> so it's all done. There's nothing to worry about. I met uh, at Cambridge uh, Carlo Rivelli, and one of the books he's written is about the order of time, which is very interesting. A lot of his stuff starts to make you think, uh, and he talks about rebellion, and I'm quite, this is my anarchist background. Rebellion is among the deepest roots of science, the refusal to accept the present order of things. Here we go, I'm back to poetry. Perhaps poetry is another of, uh, 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 another of science's deepest roots, the, ca the capacity to see what's beyond the visible, what's beyond the visible. And he talks about time is defined by the second law of dynamics. But what he does say, and quite a lot of people, are, uh, uh, theoreticians say this, that when you get down to the plank a time, plank length, you actually, time does not exist. It goes out of the equations. And he says, Carlo, time is ignorance. How does that suit you? Time is ignorance. And again, he says, nothing is valid always and everywhere. Sooner or later, we come across things uh, something that is completely new. And so I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that things that we think are absolutely true and can be trusted are not necessarily true. Uh, another one of my favorites is this one. I think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong. And we're very tempted to give answers that uh, fill in the gaps, as it were. And this is my favorite of all time. If you think that science was certain, well, that's just an error on your part. 
Uh, that's one I like to give to non-scientists. This, this le next quote is from his book, Quantum Electrodynamics, which is pretty old now, where he's talking to a bunch of general people, and he's talking about light. And he just says, well, you're not going to understand anything I'm going to say, but stick around. Um, stick around because my students don't understand it. He said, why is that? Because I don't understand light. Nobody does. He's trying to get his students to, uh, and the people who are attending his lecture to understand they're moving into the unknown, an unknown which we don't understand. Now, I, I'm quite a fan of light. I was uh, head of the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory with the current UK synchrotron light sources, the diamond light sources, and I held the um, UK shareholding in that at 86%. I was a whole, hold the sharing, used to hold the shareholding for the European light source, and I've been involved in light sources for the last 20 years or so. And so light to me is very interesting. And what it does it do? It doesn't just illuminate, it does do that. It burns, you get sunburn. It transforms, you can change the structure of matter that way by knocking it around, uh, knocking the atoms around. We use it every day in our fiber optics. Uh, it manipulates, you can use laser tweezers to move atoms and other things around. It accelerates, one of the experiments we did at the Rutherford was to accelerate electron by pulse laser beam, which uh, was the first example of showing you could perhaps um, obtain nuclear fusion by uh, accelerators, and also interrogate, interrogates by uh, uh, optical diffraction or reflection or X-ray diffraction and reflection, which we use every day of the, the week. Now, one thing that's quite interesting, though, light comes up so much in the Gospel of John. Um, there are 33 references, apparently, and this is the one I like right in the first chapter, right at the beginning. Light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood or overcome it. There are two translations and theologians and back one or the other. But I like the one that has not understood it. Because we don't understand light and darkness doesn't understand light. And light comes up so many times in those Gospels. And I just can't help thinking why it comes up so much. And uh, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed and the, the well-known I am the light of the world. Again, one of the Darwin lectures this year was by Peter Fletcher, um, and he was talking about the visual system in its structure and functions confer a ready-made tendency to create perceptions, to see visions. What do you see? What do you see? It comes up constantly in the prophets, doesn't it, and elsewhere. What do you see? What do you see? And what you do is put on to that seeing your own perceptions and visions. And he says there are two parts of seeing. One is expectation. In other words, you bring your, um, your, your own background to it and thoughts. And the other one is the actual observed input. And by putting these together, you can come up with some pretty disastrous consequences. I, used to, I have a talk which is called Seeing is Believing, and part of this talk comes from that. Um, but we have to be very careful about our scientific observations in that we don't always see the reality, because we're bringing our own perceptions to it. A little bit on optics. This was the first book on optics um, over a thousand years ago. And then we got Newton, who rolled up, just finished rereading the biography of Newton. What a nasty guy he was, um, as you probably know. Uh, but he said that uh, light was made up of particles. Then his great friend or enemy, Christian Hugen, said, no, it isn't. Uh, it's made up of waves. Uh, and then we had Clark James, Ma James Clark Maxwell rolled up. Um, with his Maxwell equations up here. And then we had Einstein, Utain, and, um, and Maxwell said they're, they're waves. Uh, and Einstein said, no, they're not, they're particles. And Richard Feynman's quote, uh, quote is, light is spooky. Okay, so where are we in all of this lot? You know, it does depend on which way you want to come. But I think Maxwell, did, it was in that earlier slide, did say something very, very important here. I should be very sorry if our interpretation founded on a most conjectured scientific hypothesis were to get fastened to the text in Genesis. The rate of change of scientific hypothesis is naturally much more rapid than that of the biblical interpretations. So that if an interpretation is founded on such a hypothesis, it may help to keep the hypothesis above ground after it ought to be buried and forgotten. I think we ought to remember that one time and time and time again, not to link the two together, otherwise we end up in very dangerous ground. Keeping ideas and opposite ideas hanging is not very comfortable. Uh, one of the preachers at my church said, we don't like tensions in, in what we believe. And I wrote to her afterwards and said, actually, I do. 
Why do I like tensions? I think new ideas come from it. This comes from a book on science fiction, but Roger Penrose, the mathematician, uh, contributed to it. In the middle of it, he talks about how you keep opposite ideas in which are in tension together. And he says it's a mark of a creative person who can tolerate dissonance. This creative person's tolerance of discomfort, of dissonance, that makes new solutions possible. Now, I know some of you come from an engineering background. When I was a small boy, I used to get bits of wood bent and put a bit of string. So tension is not a bad thing, and we need it in scientific thought. So when we approach truths, we shouldn't see them as the end point, but we should see them necessarily perhaps being part of a, an output from tension between different ideas. And that's where, obviously, the um, wave and particle things come from, not trying to resolve it, but starting to use it for good. This is another quote from uh, Feynman, which is, religion is a culture of faith, science is a culture of doubt. I turned it around and called science is a culture of faith sometimes, and religion is often a culture of doubt. And I think the two are compatible, they're intention, but it's a creative person that can cope with that tension. So honest doubt has a role in both. And I ask myself, is there a, a theology of doubt which can assist us in science? And I think one of the big problems is in both science and in, in theology, we have this concept of keyhole theology, keyhole science. In reality, we know that we can only uh, investigate less than 5%, I think it's 4% of the universe. Whether it's 68% dark energy and 27% dark matter, I don't know. I, all I do know is that some theoreticians say dark energy doesn't exist anymore. Certainly, Revelli doesn't think it does. And one of the problems we have is we subdivide all these subjects down into the minutiae of disciplines. And that only occurred in the last 150 years or so. Before that, to be a scientist was to be a much wider person. I use the, word, the German word Wissenschaft for science uh, because it's so much more embracing than our word science. And Wissenschaft means scholarship and it includes the arts, humanities, social sciences. And I think that's really important that we don't divide ourselves up. Uh, and therefore, when I call myself a scientist now, I'm thinking of myself in the German term rather than the English subdivisions. And one can argue that universities have got this hopelessly wrong, and all our little departments all um, squabbling with each other. And there's a big trouble if you go down the keyhole theology and keyhole science. And this is from a book uh, by Os Guinness. You don't see enough to come to conclusion. But once you see a little, it's difficult to resist trying. So you start to spread in the gaps. You start to fill them all in. Being insistent as well as inquisitive, we refuse to suspend judgment, and our wrong conclusions so misrepresent God, misrepresent misrepresent science, that we end up doubting him. I think that's very profound, actually. We fill in the gaps quite often, and we don't actually know where the limits are. It's very tempting, very tempting. One of the books I really do like, and I do commend to you, is this one, Doubt, Faith, and Certainty. Uh, an old colleague of mine, Tony Thistleton, was professor of Christian theology at Nottingham when I was dean of engineering there. He was talking to John Polkinghorne, the uh, um, Cambridge uh, scientist uh, and theologian, in the book, and this comes out of it, about the nature of honest doubt and where it fits, and where does faith fit, and where does certainty fit. And he says towards the end, doubt and questioning may, be op may open the door to new insights and a need to reappraise re re faith or belief. Some who claim for themselves absence of doubt and possession of utter certainty may possibly be masking a degree of arrogance beyond the display of piety. The biblical narratives anticipate partial certainty. And I would say our papers represent partial certainty in many cases, which is to be vindicated in the future. And the famous quote from uh, 1 Corinthians, for now we see the mirror dimly, but then we'll see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I've been fully known. I find that reassuring that there is a, an end to all of this. So what do we really see? Well, you've all seen this slide like this many, many times, that we only see this little portion of visible light. And yet the whole room is buzzing with different frequencies. And if you go down to x-rays or you go up to radio waves and all that lot, we know they're there. Switch on the radio in here, you'll be able to hear. You'll be picking up vibrations. But we see so little, and yet we make such sweeping uh, and generalizations in the name of truth. So light illuminates. To what extent are we actually stuck in the visible wave band? Or is it dangerous to go beyond because we don't know where we are going? I'm going to move on here because I'm going to take the example of the sun. One of the cameras we built at the Rutherford Lab was to observe the sun on a project called SOHO. 
This is an image of the sun, uh, a nuclear fusion furnace. Um, yeah, it keeps us all warm, keeps, uh, keeps the energy going, and we all like it. But, of course, it's not like that. If you change the wavelength of what you look at, you suddenly see it's a seething mass of action. Now, we don't see that, or at least we couldn't see it if we just looked up and put a shade over our eyes. You wouldn't be able to see that. It's all sort of orange. But, of course, that's not the whole truth either, because if we put an aperture over the sun, uh, there's the black aperture over the sun, we see all these magnetic flares coming out. Thousands and thousands of miles that can affect... Um, can affect uh, radio transmission and spe especially things like aircraft. This is another project. This, both these are NASA satellites, by the way. This is stereo where there are two. So we can see if that uh, storm is coming towards us and we've then got eight minutes to tell aircraft, you know, you may be in trouble for a little bit as that breakout occurs. That was actually um, five years ago. Uh, if you're worried, this is what it looked like on Wednesday. <laughs> okay. You can go on to the NASA website, you can pick up, I think it's two or three times a day, they put up all the information to show you what's going on. So, you know, it's fairly benign at the moment, but what about tomorrow? Who knows? Uh, my own subject is material science. I've spent most of a lot of life on microscopes like this. This is a Titan one with adaptive optics. And we are able to image atoms um, and make various things that are used in everyday life. Uh, except, of course, atoms don't look anything like that. They're not solid ball bearings. And I had a bright student, I was talking at the Borough Academy in South London, a, a deprived area of London, and in the front row here was a young lady, uh, and when I said this wasn't any good, you know, that it wasn't the truth, she said, but why do you do it? What's the point? I said, first of all, you should go to Cambridge to do natural sciences. Uh, and then I said, well, actually, it's good enough. It's good enough. We design most modern materials that are used for implants, that are used in semiconductors, using microscopes like this. It's good enough. But it's not the truth because we get images that are not what's really there. Um, this, this is one of my favorite pictures, this bottom one, because that is the basis for all the uh, aluminum alloys you use for your tin cans and for aircraft and every other use that uh, most aluminum is put for. It's all down to just one or two single rows of copper atoms, which is that sort of fuzzy bit in the middle. You can tell by the diffraction pattern. But there are those people like Plato who say, well, actually, that isn't true. That's not true. And that's when scientists challenged the truth. This top one you probably all recognize is Jocelyn Bell, uh, who saw the blips on her radio telescope. And uh, she went to uh, Tony Hewish, who used to be a colleague of mine at Churchill College. And she said, I've got these. He said, ah, get lost. It's not true. Then she persuaded. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize. She didn't get anything. <laughs> disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Uh, it's not true. I mean, what she saw was something. And she challenged authority. This bottom one, I don't know if anybody recognizes, Dan Sheckman. Uh, I saw that diffraction pattern, which was published when I was a research student with a friend of mine, and we immediately said, it can't be true. Now, I don't know if you, any of you know why that can't be true. I was taught crystallography uh, at Sheffield University, where I did my first degree, uh, that you could have two-fold symmetry, three-fold symmetry, four-fold symmetry, but never five-fold symmetry. Six-fold symmetry, yes, or you can never have ten-fold symmetry. That is ten-fold symmetry. It can't possibly be the case. And we went away. We sh I remember that evening we went to do the experiment with a similar material, and we saw it. And we said, we must have seen this a thousand times, but we dismissed it because we thought it couldn't be. He saw it. A little while later, Roger Penrose, the mathematician, showed how five-fold symmetry or temporal symmetry could fill space. That's two-dimensional paving slabs. If you ever go to Wadham College in Oxford, you'll see, those aren't the Wadham College slabs, but you'll see a path made out of these slabs that he can fill space. This is two-dimensional, he did it in three-dimensional. He got the Nobel Prize for it. Good for Dan. I met him fairly soon after he did that, and I still wondered whether he was telling the truth or not, whether he fixed it. There you are, truth under power, and you need people like that who actually question what's going on. Then I was, uh, one of my great uh, experiences was to attend the Nobel Prize giving ceremony in Sweden um, some years back when the prize for physics went to two characters who did this experiment to look at the cosmic microwave background from the edge of the universe. And we get fantastic information. This I, I'm not a cosmologist or anybody who can understand that. But then we've got more scientists coming along and said, but is it really true? Because that left 14 point, well, we're in it 13.3 billion years ago. We're just picking it up. Um, but also, is there a wormhole we can get through into another universe? I also went to a talk where a theoretician said, yeah, you can get through to another universe. A photon can get through before the wormhole collapses. 
I don't know whether it's true. The mathematics completely baffled me. But I just like to think to myself, I have no idea whether that's true or not, or whether it is the truth. It was true for then, but is it the truth? I don't know. I think we have to ask in these circumstances, where, we, where do we fit in? Are we true, or are we a figment of our imaginations? Uh, how can we enjoy the fullness of God when we see so little or understand so little? Is the earth an accident, or are we co-creators? I like to think we are. And in Tony Thistleton's book, which I mentioned earlier, Doubt, Faith, and Certainty, he says we need ways of thinking, models or metaphors that try and enable us to live in this space which is true enough, but is not the absolute truth. True enough. Uh, we all live by Newton's laws. Uh, we call them laws, don't we, when they're not laws. And Newton's theories, which break down. But for most of us, for most of our lives, in fact, probably for most of us, all our lives, we live by them. How do we, uh, how do we cope with that? Now, as I said in the introduction, I'm a consultant to CERN. I go there once or twice a month. Um, and it was set up really to understand where the big questions would be answered. What is really, really there? And this is a compact muon solenoid. In fact, of course, I've just lied to you again, because uh, that's actually a composite photograph made by an artist in residence. You can't get far enough back to take that photograph of the whole thing. So he did thousands and thousands and thousands of photographs, and so that is a meta image of uh, compact muon solenoid. Um, but it, it's huge, uh, absolutely huge, and it was one of the detectors that found the so-called Higgs boson. Um, now, Peter Higgs was in the same place. Peter is there looking and seeing what came out of his theory. Uh, he wasn't the only one to go there. I drop in from time to time. And this is the evidence, the first evidence of the first run. I haven't got any other evidence. And you see there, absolutely obvious that the Higgs, is, uh, Higgs field does exist. Pretty obvious, isn't it? <laughs> it's at 126 TGV, and you just see that little, you can see it better on the uh, CMS data than you can on the um, uh, Atlas data, but that's where that little blip is. Is it true? Is it true? Well, I, before the data came out, I knew the Director General, Ralph Dieter Hoyer, very well, and we were in Dublin together, and he was just walking past me in the coffee break. I said, Dieter, have you found it? He said, five nines, just walked on. Yes, it's 99.999% certain, statistically, that there is something there. But whether it's just one thing or many, we don't know. I'm not a particle physicist, so don't push me on that. But I like to show you that, that you need to test these data to see if they're absolutely true. But of course, we don't know what's inside those. Are they really fundamental particles, or are there other things to find out? We know so little. Now, I'm moving on to something else which I've had a lot to do with, which is a movement in the powerhouse of Brussels. And this is part of a presentation I gave to the Competitiveness Council, the Council of Ministers, uh, some five years ago, on the impact of what's called open science, or it was called Science 2.0. Uh, in fact, we're going right back to the past. We're going back to the Renaissance in many ways. But open science, and I said three things to them. I said, we, first of all, you won't understand what it is. Second thing is, we don't know where it's going. I said, the third thing is, don't regulate. And of course, what are they doing now? They're trying to regulate it. But there we go. Such is life. We've had five years. What is it? It's about sharing of information freely with each other. Instead of bundling it up and publishing it on your own, you make it freely available. And the quote which will come up is, all publicly funded research must be publicly available. Uh, this was the slide that I showed them at the time. That should have killed them off. Um, but that was the ecosystem then. It's got much more complicated about where open science is coming from. From open data at one end, citizen science, open access, all these things all starting to form an ecosystem which wasn't around 10, 15 years ago. It's changed the whole way of which, which science should be, should be done. Of course, academics resist it as if there's no tomorrow, but uh, this is how we're going. And one reason for this, this is a slide from Microsoft, Tony Hayes' slide, is that we're in a, a period of profound change. So right in the early days, we had people, astronomers or astrologers, looking at the sky. Then we got the theoreticians. We got Newton's laws, Maxwell's laws. Then we got into large computers that could do massive simulations. Now in the business of data-intensive science huge data banks coming through. CERN churns out about 50 petabytes of data a year. That's only 0.1% of the data it can produce. It has to get rid of the rest. Otherwise, it swamps the World Wide Web in 10 seconds. But some of the experiments being planned now are orders of magnitude greater than that. 
So the Elixir project, which is about genomics, is at the hexabyte data, as is indeed the new telescopes, the square kilometre array built in Africa and across Australasia. Uh, those are going to turn out petabytes, as indeed paleontology is doing as well. So we've suddenly got into an area of huge amounts of data in different locations, all trying to interpret and interact with each other. Where does truth lie in all that lot? Is there a pinhead or, or, or needle in that haystack? It's more than a haystack. How are you going to operate in that environment, and where does truth lie? I won't go through this. This is a panel I'm on, the Open Science Policy Platform, the European Community. Commission, uh, you can see where it fits, but the ones I want to focus on, I'm going to look at fair data and I'm going to look at citizen science, because that's where we start to see in how it interacts with what I've been talking about. Things like rewards and incentives when you have multi-author papers because you're putting all the data together. Who is it who's going to be truthful in that? Who's going to pull the plug say, I don't believe your information? Uh, exactly 10 years ago, I was asked to chair this for the European Commission, which is a so-called high-level expert group. I've never met a low-level expert group. They're all high level. <laughs> uh, but if you ever meet one, they're probably better than we were. And we were asked to look at what the impact of all this was going to be on research in, in Europe over the next 20 to 30 years. And we came up with these ideas that we were going to call them global co-laboratories. Okay, so they're huge laboratories, but in, located in different locations. And very much they're focused on the big issues of society. They're not piddling away with little issues and disciplines, but it's about the big challenges that we're facing. And one of the things we talked about, about our vision, it's 2030 and we're almost halfway there. It's amazing. Um, I can tell you much about this committee. It was a great committee. And what we said is that data science needs to be taught from primary school upwards, that this is going to be a new language, a data literacy to go alongside language literacy uh, and uh, mathematical literacy that's going to be there. The impact is that citizens start to be able to interrogate what scientists are doing. Shock, horror. We put ourselves up for analysis. But not only can they interrogate what we're doing, they can start to use it. And the media can use it as well and misrepresent it. So how do you get around that? How can we question statements made like they've already been doing on small scale, but when they get big, that's really big. Uh, one of the institutions that's come out of that in the last two or three years, based in the University of Leiden, is uh, an organization called GoFair. And FAIR stands for Findable, Accessible, Interoperable, and Reproducible. This is a bio bioinformatics guy set this up, Baron Mont, and it's now global. In three years, it's gone totally global. And one of the organizations that came out before this, which came out of my report, was called the Research Data Alliance, which went from nothing in 2014, now has over 9,000 researchers in 140 countries sharing information. That's the scale of which all this has happened. But along with rapid scale, uh, rapid expansion like that, comes the issue of provenance and trust. And so we're back to truth and trust again. Uh, about the same time, actually a year earlier, I prepared this other report. You think I spend my whole time writing reports. Actually, I don't write any of these. I get uh, journalists to ghost them for me, but uh, uh, I do recommend that if you want to get through the politicians. It was about the future of European research over the next 20 years. Uh, and it, those familiar with the European programs, this actually influenced the Horizon 2020 program. All its recommendations were adopted. Um, but it was talking about preparing Europe for a new renaissance, going back to the past going back to when scientists in the wider sense were vision staff type of scientists rather than our own definition of scientists. And this was in the um, foreword by uh, Jacek Potocznik, who was the commissioner, a well-known volleyball player and a commissioner for the European Commission. Really nice guy, actually, uh, an ec economist of the University of Ljubljana. And he talked about, we need this now, we need this idea of holistic thinking, which epitomized the first renaissance. When scholars and artists moved around and chatted, whether it was Erasmus or Newton or whoever, and they talked to each other in, across disciplines. Now he's saying that needs to return, but it now needs to be everybody should be able to do that. Everybody should be able to do that. And that's what this report was about, and that's where we come from. In another report that came out from uh, part of the European Parliament, again about eight years ago, uh, was based on this, that knowledge is no longer concentrated in the hands of a few. It can be created and shared by ordinary citizens everywhere, challenging the legitimacy of traditional sites of knowledge and information production, such as universities and the media. So that's universities out the door as well. So. But somebody actually has to do the work. This was a very challenging report. Um, it's now a bit dated and it's been updated about what's happening to the um, 
world population in terms of uh, internet sharing and how, how actually the focus is moving away completely from Europe and even America towards Asia and Middle East and China. And then we're seeing that now. And that was predicted a long time ago. And it's really happening. I have a slide of how internet access in India has just gone sky high, for instance. One of the things that came out just over a year ago is when the European, uh, sorry, the research councils, both the European Research Council, our own research councils, and other research councils like BMBF in Germany uh, got together and they came out with what's called Plan S. Uh, everybody heard of Plan S? Shook my academic part of the world, <laughs> um, which was saying, no, all these principles of open science have to be followed, have to be followed, and will become mandatory. So, first of all, we see the nature of science changing, and we see the way it's being done, and how it will go forward in the future. So, this gives us big, big issues. And this is the basis, all publicly funded research must be public available, except for things to do with security and personal health. Uh, nobody quite knows how to deal with those. And the question is, can you trust everybody else's? Can you trust everybody else's? How can you prove that what they've done is actually what they say they've been doing? How can you do that? So we all start to take over persistent identifiers, and we register as ORCID users uh, and other things just to give ourselves, this Joe Bloggs is that Joe Bloggs that did that work, and we can verify what he or she has said. And then we've got the whole thing is, what do you do about uh, information that is actually exploitable? Uh, that's one of the things I've been working on at the moment. And how do you actually teach in this environment? How do you teach in this environment? So what do the high priests of science have to say in this particular environment when they have no control over anybody, or potentially no control? This is the C Citizen Science Lab. It's about five years ago now, four or five years ago, looking at how citizen science could be used for global challenges, and prizes were awarded, and they're still going on at the moment. So this is very much now part of what science is about. But if you talk to most scientists, they wouldn't have a clue that this is going on. And there are various projects of citizen science, you've probably heard of one, this is old weather, which is rather fun, off the log books of the British Navy, 100 and odd years ago. I just put in this just to show you my concept of vision shaft, it includes Shakespeare. Um, you can read uh, words got to be recorded and actually checked from Shakespeare. And there's hundreds of projects like that. Uh, the League of European Research Universities, they recognize this uh, about three years ago, and came up with a list of recommendations on how to handle it. The next slide does have these recommendations. It's about how do you actually guarantee that the truth will come out of these uh, exercises. And now we come back to the poetry angle. Uh, this is by Walter Bergman, Bergman, who's a theologian, and the use of fiction. And I'm going to come on to this, how we use fiction, how we use poetry. It's the daring work of fiction to probe beyond the truth, the settled truth, and to walk on the edge of alternatives not yet available to us. It is this probe behind our settlement that makes newness possible. And this is the work I'm doing in CERN at the moment in the project called Idea Square. And the next slide shows this. Welcome to Idea Square. It's a place where scientists and society meet to push the boundaries of knowledge and to share and explore new ways to, re to reach societal impact through research and technology. A space designed for collaboration through curiosity, creativity, and science. And I love this one, a place where people have a license to dream. And this is the building. It's an old warehouse where part of the Atlas detector was put. Um, you'll notice one or two features about it, that uh, it's, it's a flexible space, that people sitting on bean bags. There's one or two other notable features, like these glass, cu oops, glass cubicles. Um, do you notice anything else not odd about that? Oh, you've seen the double-decker bus. That's the meeting room. If you've got a good, a good idea, you run and ring the bell, see who joins you. <laughs> there are other parts here, too, which you can't see. I know, I know where they are. If you find it's all too much, you think yourself overcome, being worried that you're not fitting in, you go and stand there. It's called a hugging point. Somebody will come put their arms around you and say, it's okay, you're one of us. Don't worry <laughs> about it. And groups are coming there. I'm working with the Royal College of Art at the moment. Uh, two years ago, they brought 20 students out as a pilot. Um, to do this, and we give them grand challenges to see how they come up. Last year, 420 students signed up for this course uh, for three months. And the Royal College of Art have now got a formal agreement with CERN to pursue this way of teaching art students in the nature of science in the future. I tell you, it's hard work. I have to m mentor these people, and you're doing about uh, one 
project every five minutes <laughs> to get through the numbers. But it's exciting. Cambridge University Engineering Department use this. They come out as well. Other groups come from Barcelona, from India, or from Australia. We put together from people from different disciplines and different cultures and say, here's a space where you have a license to dream. So that's really where I'm working at the moment, and uh, I, I do encourage it. But the real reason is that the way science is being done has changed or is changing dramatically. And the nature of truth is changing dramatically. And I don't know how we're going to handle this. I don't know what's going to... I mean, part of me thinks there's going to be a big bang and we get rid of it. But, of course, our lack of understanding has always been there. And one of my favorite quotes of Jesus is from this parable of the sower, as it's called. And he takes a quote from Isaiah. And again, Paul uses it in his very last statement in Acts. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. And then the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. So for me, one of the areas of Christians and scientists is actually being humble enough to realize that we don't understand and actually to seek answers that we really get to the heart of things and admit when we're wrong or, or, or not, not wholly in charge of the truth. And one of the things I think, uh, my message, if it's like that I am a bit of a politician these days, to, to scientists who are Christians or Christians who have an interest in science, is that we've got to take our responsibility in this field very, very um, positively and, and not let it just take over. I've got a great burden that the Church of England ought to have a chief scientist who leads the way in science. Most of what I hear from the Church of England is after something's happened. It's too late. We want people to get in there in the front line. It means getting dirty. It means getting in with the, with the political side of science as well. So we take our responsibility and that our role as scientists is not just to be a priest in this environment, but to follow Jesus as being prophetic as well and also to have kingly aspects of authority that we need as well. So we finally finish, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. So they put it on a stand and gives its light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Mm -hmm.